Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. Workplace sexual harassment is very much a part of the national discussion these days. Do we really know exactly what it is? More importantly, perhaps, is how can it be prevented and stopped? We have with us today two St. Louisans very much involved in the issue. Bing Dempy Wolf is a human resources consultant with Tai Chi Consulting. She has a lot of experience working on sexual harassment issues. Ken Cooper is the founder of CooperCom Inc., a consulting firm. Ken and his firm have provided sexual harassment training and consulting for 30 years now. He is the author of Stop It Now How Targets and Managers Can Stop Sexual Harassment. Thank you both so much for being here. Nice to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Ken, I'm going to start with you because I have a quote from you from your website saying, harassment is not a new epidemic. It never went away. It's been around for a while. It's really interesting. If you look at the data um, 30 years ago, depending on the survey, you saw somewhere between 40 and 80 percent of women would say they'd been harassed, 15 to 30 percent of men Mm -hmm. sexually harassed. That was 30 years ago. The data is the exact same now. There's been no change. Right. How do you define it, Bing? I mean, it, it seems like it's different strokes for different folks on this. It is. So today, as Ken says, the harassment really hasn't changed. I think there's more awareness today mm-hmm. around it. And in the past, people just didn't recognize it that it was sexual harassment, mm-hmm. whereas today it's more out in the open. But if it means different things to different people, I, you know, I'm having trouble figuring out how you define that it has happened if it's different things to different people. It depends on the situation. Every it's not black and white. That's mm-hmm. the problem about sexual harassment. It actually depends on how that individual takes it. It's the individual, the, the victim, male or female. Correct. And it's important, Ken, to point out that as you did, that there's a, a surprisingly high number of cases involving men being the victims. Absolutely, and I don't even like to use the term victim. We'll use the term target <clears throat> because you can be targeted with harassment, but you don't have to be victimized by it. There's a lot of things you can do back. So, um, you know, we talk about the offender and the target. Are we talking about a super sensitivity today uh, following the Harvey Weinstein case and others that we come to mind? Well, you know, those cases are so egregious. They're so bad yeah. that there's not much sensitivity to them. Um, but you do find people struggling with the lower levels of harassment. And, in fact, we detail six different levels. Right. And the first one is what we call aesthetic appreciation. You know, that's where I say, boy, do you look sharp today or something like that where, okay, it's not totally out of the realm of how people talk to each other. But you know what? It's focusing on something that doesn't have anything to do with work. But someone might find that objectionable to be spoken to that way. Being up, up with this, might find it objectionable to be spoken to that way, and others not at all. No problem. Right, and that's why it's based on an individual, and then also how they approach it and their body language that goes with it. So that really depicts how someone will take it. That has to make it difficult for someone in human resources, for instance, to know how to deal with it if it's going to be, if it happens to two different women, let's say, two different targets. Uh, and they they approach it uh, differently. How does how does H and R deal with it? That that is a very difficult subject sometimes because it depends on that person. One might just want someone to be said, "Hey, stop!" But it should be that individual's responsibility to tell that uh, person that's um, abusing it, if you would, to stop. I'm not comfortable with that. And others don't want to say anything because they're afraid that they'll be targeted or they're going to lose their job because, you know, it's a male, it can be a female, because there's also the same sex where they actually harass same sex individuals as well. Mm -hmm. But it is, you have to kind of go and question them and find out how they feel. How do you recommend a a situation like that be dealt with, Ken? Well, the first thing is uh, the EEOC says harassment has to be unwelcome. Mm-hmm. So you need to look somebody in the eye and say, listen, I don't appreciate that. I wish you'd stop. And if it persists or if the incident was so severe, and these are all terms without really solid definitions, but either it's too, it's persistent or it's severe, then report it to HR and get them involved. Mm-hmm. What you, you mentioned the first level is the aesthetic appreciation, if you will. Let's go through some of the other levels. Okay, the next level, and, and we give them names uh, because you want to make this whole behavior uncool. 
So the next level we call uh, active mental groping. And uh, that's where somebody's staring where they shouldn't be. Uh, they walk up behind somebody that, so their space is invaded. A man will walk up behind a woman seated and she turns around and there he is right in front of her. She's staring at his belt buckle. Um, it's that look that say, you know, women will say, did you see the way he looked at me? I just mm. ugh, can't stand it. Uh, suggestive comments. It's all that borderline kind of uh, behavior that's irritating. And again, it's singling out the worker's sex, the person's sex, rather than well, what they're doing at work. Mm-hmm. And the next level? Well, uh, then you have social touching. You know, a man will go up behind a woman and, and start to give her back, oh, I bet that feels good. And most women will say, no, it doesn't. You know, it makes me cringe. I don't want to be pawed by somebody. Keep your hands off me. But they're very careful to keep all their touching in acceptable areas, uh, you know, shoulders, back, and so on. But it's just uh, uh, constant touching. Then there's, uh, we call it foreplay harassment. That's where the touching starts to get into areas where it shouldn't be. That's where the hand is dropping over the shoulder, the uh, wrapping around the waist a little too far, dropping down the back, and so on. And they're just pushing, 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 pushing. And then there is true harassment where somebody's touching areas they shouldn't, like a uh, ex-president in a wheelchair who uh, was patting women's bottoms. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's level five, and then level six is outright assault. Right. What do you find yourself dealing with, Bing, most of the time when you're talking to targets, I'll use that word, uh, who have gone through these ex- kinds of experience? Basically the uncomfortableness of mm-hmm. uh, someone touching them or even saying certain words to them where it's suggestive. Mm-hmm. And that's the biggest thing And because sometimes it becomes the he said, she said thing. Yeah. So that's where you have to really sit down and investigate the whole situation because sometimes it could just be a misunderstanding. One of the biggest things today that we've been brought into is managing the different generations and how things are acceptable. In the past, um, if I had a boss that gave me a bottle of wine or a gift card because I did something well on a project, I would say, oh, thanks. They thought very highly of me, so I appreciate that. Today, different generations will take that as a sexual in- invite. Mm-hmm. If I gave them a wine, then they want me to go out or they want me to do something else. I'll go back to that term I used earlier, super sensitivity. Do you think that's part of the issue today and why the generational difference exists? Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, that there are there are real differences, uh, not only by generations, but even areas of the country. Mm-hmm. You know, certain areas of the country are more aggressive than others, more verbally aggressive. Here in the Midwest, we're probably a little more civil, a little more polite. So we'd expect that from someone. And so the level of tolerance may be a little less here than it might be on the coast, for example. I, I want to open our phone lines to this because I think the audience probably will have some questions and maybe ask for a little assistance in how to deal with this. 382-8255 is the number. That's 382-TALK. You can send us an email to talk at stlpublicradio.org, or if you would prefer to send us a tweet, do so at STL on air. Is there a profile of someone who is sexually abusive and a profile of a, a target? There are some surveys. Years ago, the Merit Systems Protection Board did a study, and um, there there are – it's not so much a profile as characteristics. So it tends to be um, a male harasser, higher level in the organization, acting alone, not as a group, and uh, uh, harassing someone lower in the organization that has some vulnerability that they feel like they can leverage. Uh, that tends to be a, a general pattern. Uh, do you have anything to uh, to add to that? Uh, I agree. Bill? It's yeah. the authority, the power, because if I don't do this, then I'm going to lose my job. So they're afraid, so they will go along with that and then start feeling very uncomfortable. So that seems to be what is happening in the workplace today, is that women, to a very large degree, if they have been targeted, are uh, are going to be reluctant to go to the H&R department, HR department. Yes, and again, because they feel that they did something wrong, they'll be the target then where other um, coworkers will make fun of them and say, oh, why are you making such a big deal about it? They're afraid they're going to lose their job. They're afraid they're going to lose that department position. Ken, did you? Well, it's also being called out. When, you, when you're being harassed, it's a form of put down. It's a form of bullying. It's a form of marginalizing. So I always talk about uh, you say a curse word in a meeting and point to the woman and go, oh, pardon my French. You're not being polite. It's put down. Mm-hmm. You're going, oh, yeah, for the woman there, I know you're sensitive to this. And so I'm, if I'm continually calling you out, 
uh, you know, even people who wear glasses could figure it out. Even people who wear glasses, you know, whatever. It's a difference creator. Mm -hmm. I'm pulling you out of the team and saying you're different because of your gender. So it's a put down. Bing, is there any defense for any of this? Uh, I, I can imagine that some guys would say, oh, I was just kidding around. I was just joking. Well, we go, get into training and yeah. training organizations, but really you, the boring, you know, sexual harassment, I have to do the compliance, but it's really changing the culture and actually changing behaviors of the people in that organization. The training? Yes. Is change, is, what, what does the training consist of? Today, there's a lot of places where they just put videos up and they have them do the video. We actually go in and do face-to-face -face training and actually show them and go through examples and body language and say, you know, if I look somebody up and down and do some funny faces with it, it just feels creepy, like Ken said before. And we have to teach those targets to say, don't do that, please. I don't. That makes me feel uncomfortable. So are you, who are you training, men and women? We train both, men yeah. and women. How about your, your training? Uh, Same. Uh, there's all employee training. There's separate training for managers, leadership training. Uh, there's investigative training for HR. Um, one of the things you have to do, too, is you've got to make harassment uncool. You've got to make the offender a, a uh, uh, object of ridicule. And so, you know, we'll say, look, I, I, take a bar situation. A healthy person walks up to a woman in a bar and says, uh, can I buy you a drink or would you like to have dinner with me? And the woman goes, no. Well, you know what? There's 3.7 billion women on Earth. Go find another one who likes you. I mean, there's somebody out there. I mean, prisoners get married, for heaven's sakes. You'll find somebody who likes you, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but the offender keeps pushing. Push, 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 even when they've been turned down. So the same thing happens in a business. And so you've got to point out, hey, these guys are losers. And as soon as it becomes loser behavior, it's no longer cool. And you start getting people not to want to do it because there's peer pressure that says, oh, look at that buffoon. He's bothering a woman. Is that training going to work against someone who does keep push, push, pushing? Well, at that point, you may need to bring in the, the HR department. You may need to uh, show them the policy that says up to and including termination. I was just about to ask what weapons you have being to deal with a situation like this. Termination being the, uh, you know, the, the ultimate weapon, I suppose. But what, what are levels uh, leading up to that, perhaps, that you could use? We do verbal. If it's just an innocent, yeah. somebody didn't know and didn't realize that they were making someone feel uncomfortable, we do verbal. We can get to written if, it's pos if it has to be. And then typically you get that. And then if they keep doing it, it's termination. What, what is verbal? I mean, what, what sorts of things would you say? I would say, Don, we had an issue where Could someone... Could you use another <laughs> okay, name, please? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ken. Yeah, yeah, there you um, go. Ken, yeah. there's a situation where we were brought to our attention that you were in a public group and public um, area in the workplace, and you made someone feel uncomfortable, and this is what was said. First, we asked, because we don't want to accuse because it's always alleged, and then we ask that question to Ken, and then Ken will come back and give us, and then if it is, we'll say, okay, please don't do that again, and then mm. we note that as a verbal warning. Mm. And, and I would say, uh, let's don't pound on the offenders too much, because probably, I, I don't know an exact number, 90, 95% of the time, uh, it's a healthy interchange. Somebody says, listen, I don't appreciate when you do that. And the other person says, oh, my gosh, I didn't know. I'm sorry. Right. Thanks for telling me. It mm -hmm. won't happen again. And you know what? It's done and dealt with. Mm -hmm. It's those 5% or whatever they are where somebody doesn't get the message. That's when you have to step in. Mm -hmm. We're talking about sexual harassment in the workplace, and uh, we're going to continue that discussion in just a moment. My guests in studio are Ken Cooper and Big Nepi Wolf, uh, experts on the subject of sexual harassment in the workplace. We'll be back to continue this conversation in just a moment. Stay with us. Again, if you'd like to get into the conversation, 382-8255 is the number. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. And we're back to our discussion of sexual harassment in the workplace. We have a man here who uh, has written as saying he did not want to be identified to say that he is being harassed in the workplace by a woman, but no one believes him. What should he do? Who's got the answer to that? Uh, as an HR-type person, Bing, what do you think? I would say that they need to probably bring in HR 
and go to HR unless typically we try to say go to your supervisor if you feel comfortable enough going to the supervisor Mm -hmm. and telling them. If not, then definitely go to your HR department and let them know that you are being harassed. Bing, uh, Bing. Ken, any any, uh, other device for this gentleman? It brings up the point of how hard it is for a target of harassment, male or female, to talk about it often. And so uh, interesting, uh, interestingly enough, to Bing's point earlier, uh, people will ask, what about reverse harassment, you know, uh, female harassment of a male? That's actually the fourth most likely. Uh, second most likely is male harassment of a male, and third most likely is female harassment of a female. Mm-hmm. And about six-tenths of a percent of the cases are the case your uh, contact there mentioned, which is a female harassment of a male. So it happens just very, very rarely. I, I would gather, I'm, I'm assuming here, Bing, that uh, f- for men to come in uh, to HR and complain is, is probably less likely than a woman doing it, men having the macho thing going for them. I would tend to agree. Yeah. What, what, how, do you, how, how do they approach you when they come in and, and talk about it? They should be able to feel comfortable coming in and telling yeah. us a situation that's at hand. And then we have to just walk through and say, where was it at? Was it at the workplace? Was it off-site? Um, just kind of walking through the details of how they feel that. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a big piece of the training is letting everybody know what's the process. Mm-hmm. What are your options? You know, for example, some companies will say, well, go to your manager. Well, what if the manager is the one harassing? Mm-hmm. So you need to have uh, a number of different people you can go to. And if you include that as part of the training so everybody's comfortable, and if they see that it works – in other words, they can go somewhere and something actually then happens, uh, then I think more and more employees are more comfortable to bring it up. What about uh, third-party involvement? I'm thinking of uh, a, a coworker who sees something that makes him or her uncomfortable just to being uh, privy to it. What, what happens in these situations? Well, that's called bystander training, and that's mm-hmm. a formal training topic where you teach people what to do as bystanders. And they have actually five or six different ways they can handle the situation. You know, they can intervene. They can comment. Uh, they can go to the person afterward and say, are you okay? What can I help you with? Um, they can uh, interrupt. You know, somebody's being harassed. You might walk up to them and start a conversation with them and walk them off get them out of the situation and, and diffuse it. So uh, people need to know what to do. A lot of companies will have a policy. Uh, think of it as the service academies. You know, you won't lie, cheat, or steal, and you will not tolerate anybody who does. So your policy should say what bystanders are expected to do as part of your policy. Right. Uh, is there ever a situation in which law enforcement would be called in? We have had that before in the past where it was very aggressive, but that's that last form of um, harassment. And we've had people that we've had to call because they were physically touching that person and hurting them. It's assault. Right. Yeah. Does, um, th- this goes on the employee's record, the, the abuser, the harasser, if you, if you will, correct? Yes. And can that be used against the uh, the employee if they change jobs? Is that a record that is likely to follow them? Again, we're uh, so uh, we're not lawyers, and uh, that's a that's a legal question. In general, companies are advised that the only thing they should share is time of employment and title, and that's it. Uh, no other no other information. Otherwise, there can be legal ramifications. So most companies won't share that information. I would think there would also be legal ramifications for that third party, the bystander, if they make an accusation that uh, maybe doesn't hold up or is inflated or whatever. Well, if a target <clears throat> files a false complaint, there have been court cases where they have had to pay legal fees. Uh, I don't know of any damages, but there there is at least a precedent that there can be penalties for false complaints. Now, the other thing is there are uh, special situations, for example, in the medical community, where a state may require an employer to divulge information if there was violence. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, again, that depends on your state law, and that will vary by location. And that, uh, if there's violence, obviously, then the law enforcement uh, uh, comes into the picture. Exactly. There are also consensual relationships in in the office, uh, and I suppose this is something that third parties could view and maybe misinterpret. What about that? What about the the uh, consensual relationships? 
so you're right. Third parties can take a look and see that. Yeah. Most companies will put in their handbooks a policy in regards to sharing that information, especially if it's like a manager and a worker in that department. They're supposed to disclose that relationship. And a lot of times that's where you can actually address that with that person if they're not aware. Because we've had people that come to HR and say, Ken and Bing are actually acting kind of funny and they're hanging out a lot. And we'll just sit there and we'll say, well, they have a relationship. Given the fact that the numbers haven't changed over the last 30 years, would you anticipate, Ken, uh, given all the attention it's getting now, that, that perhaps those numbers will change? I'm hoping they will. But the problem is the traditional approach hasn't worked. The yeah. traditional training, that which is we'll give them the legal ramifications, we'll make sure they sign off so we we're protected, uh, it's just not working. And so what Bing and I do is to focus on the behavioral side. That's been missing for most of the training. People walk out of the training and they say, I get the legalities. What do I go do? How do I go act differently? What do I say or what do I don't say? Uh, what are easy tests so that I know that I don't cross the line? And if you can give them that, then you'll start changing behavior. And that's what's been missing. And that's what we're we're covering in the sessions that a lot of people don't. What are they? Well, for example, there are, there are five easy tests to know if you're going over the line. Number one, would you love to see it on the front page of the Wall Street Journal? <laughs> would you like to be on the front page of MSN, a picture of you doing whatever you're doing with a quote of what you mm-hmm. said? Uh, would you do it in front of your significant other? Would you do it to your CEO's boss, a policeman's wife, a big guy in a bar, his girlfriend? Um, would you uh, – if you ask yourself, is this okay to do? The answer is no. Mm-hmm. It's like telling a, a racy joke in a speech. If you have to ask yourself, gee, I wonder if this is a little too racy, don't tell it. You just answered your question. The mere fact that you're asking. But the big one is the legal question of why did you need to do it? Mm-hmm. So if I do something and I end up getting sued, I'm going to be sitting in the, the witness dock, and the plaintiff lawyer is going to say, why did you need to do it? Not what's wrong with it, but defend yourself. What part of the process required you to put your hands on somebody? Mm-hmm. What part of the process required you? Uh, what drove business results for you making a comment on somebody's appearance? And, of course, that's when harassment falls apart. You don't need to do it to get your job done. Of course, when you get to that point, the damage has already been done. If you're, if you're asking someone, why did you do this and why do you do this, the damage is done. Yeah, the last one is, but the rest of them can keep you out of trouble. You know, if you start asking yourself, don't do it. Uh, if you would be a little bit embarrassed if it was publicized, don't do it. Yeah. It's very simple, actually, to stay away from the line. What about psychological helping? Is, uh, does this enter into the picture on, on, on your level, the HR level, or – in the business uh, community at all? Should, should the businesses be making suggestions like that, that you need some psychological help or even providing it somehow? So on the psychological, we do a lot of times the companies offer like an employee assistance program. Mm-hmm. And if they feel uncomfortable and they just felt like it's something wasn't right, we actually will suggest that employee assistance program to them and they have a place to go. And we in HR don't know anything about it. The company doesn't know anything about it. The managers don't know. And that's just a place where they can go and feel comfortable and just vent or explain what their situation is. It seems like this problem has gotten so bad or has remained so bad that a whole corporate infrastructure has been developed uh, to deal with it. It has. Yeah. And it's the awareness. I think that what Ken said, it's changing the behaviors. Because until we can change that culture and the behaviors inside of that culture, it's very difficult to diffuse it. How long does it take to change a behavior like this, Ken? Well, um, we've all had heated discussions and sessions from folks in denial. You know, folks pushing back saying, listen, I, I don't believe in this. You know, I can't even talk to a woman anymore now. You know, can I compliment somebody? You're ruining the whole relationship. So you get all this pushback, and you can turn that around in a single session. It's attitudes. And again, as a group, the group will start sharing, listen, that really does bother me. Why do you have to do that? And if you get people talking to each other, you can start seeing some attitudes change. And you can do that quickly. Yeah. I have a a, a, a note here in front of me saying, there is, is there a growth in digital harassment? These days, everything's digital, and that, that opens up a whole new avenue and pathway for dealing with this. You're both nodding your head. Address that for me, Bing, if you would. And that's a part of our training that we perform is, is that we talk about if there's a crude joke or something that you got in an email, don't pass it on. Just mm-hmm. don't do it because what Ken said before, if it doesn't feel right, sound right, don't do it. And they that digital because it's a joke or a picture of something, and people will start sending it out to the whole organization and we just 
tell them not to do it. But social media is a big thing, too, from the digital perspective. You have to be careful what you say on social media because it follows. It's there permanently. It's forever. Yeah, right. it's forever. Ken, your thoughts on that? Well, I had a question come up. Somebody – I had a client where an employee was sexting during breaks on company premises. And the employee said, well, it's my own time. I, I get to do what I want. And so uh, they asked, well, what, what's your take on that? And I said, well, number one, they're on company premises. Number two, it's during work hours. Uh, number three, you're taking time away from work, whether it's time off or you know break time or not. Uh, and number four, if anybody else sees that and is offended by it, then that's part of your liability. So the message is, no, don't do it. Yeah. Um, and as, as we know, you know, taking pictures and sending them around can get you in trouble here. Yeah. I talked uh, a, a few moments ago about uh, a, a corporate infrastructure being developed to deal with this situation. Well, what has yet to be done? What needs to be done that isn't being done right now, would you say? I think the training has to be improved. It's got to go beyond the legal ramifications or the legal rules, uh, reading the policy statement, getting everybody to sign, and getting people to really understand and really empathize. So let's go back to that culture of civility. You know, it's the idea of how do we expect people to behave here at work? And by the way, the, everything we're talking about is only at work. We get a lot of questions about what, are, what about these public, you know, articles. We call mm-hmm. that men behaving badly. And it's not sexual harassment because it didn't happen at work. Mm-hmm. It, it's still offensive behavior, but it's not illegal behavior. We're talking here, this is illegal behavior, a violation of Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act. And you have to deal with it. What would you do, Bing, if you, uh, in order to improve what's being done now? I think the training is the biggest thing, and you yeah. have to have leadership's buy-in. Because if the leadership doesn't do it, then it doesn't change that culture of the organization. Going back to what Ken said is like if Ken and I and a group of people were in the room and Ken saw something that was uncomfortable, he should be able to go call it out on that person, interrupt him, say, hey, you're, you're not doing that. That's not cool for Bing. Mm-hmm. Don't do that. And I think if we start holding and changing that culture, it kind of makes everyone else hold each other accountable for their mm-hmm. actions. Uh, are all companies required to provide this kind of training? You mentioned Title VII. They do, and they're required to have a policy, but for a lot of them, it's lip service. I I wrote an article for Excellence Essentials magazine, and I talked about what we've done wrong. And one of them was uh, companies that don't really mean it. You know, they say it, but then uh, they'll have a convention, and they'll pay for the bar bill, and they know everybody gets uh, uh, drunk and, as we say, hijinks ensue, and they're paying for it. Mm-hmm. So it's, and nobody cares. So all this bad behavior is going on. The company is paying for it. Well, it, that sends a message. They don't really mean it. Mm-hmm. You know, we had the training, but look how everybody behaves at the convention. It's like a joke that they just checked off the box and said, I got them to sign off on something, so I'm compliant. Well, it's not so funny anymore, is it, uh, no. given what we've been going through and what, what we've been hearing. Any final line you want to put in this, Bing, before we say goodbye? No, I think that we can help any organization with HR consulting from sexual harassment and visit our website at tai-chi-consulting.com. We will put a link to that website on ours at stlpublicradio.org. How about you, Ken? A final thought? Uh, Same thing, and that is to look beyond the traditional approach. It hasn't worked. And then, again, our information is at stopshnow.com. And we'll have a link to that as well. The fact of the matter is that this is as serious a problem as most people think it is, even even though it's uh, getting so much publicity today. Thank you both so much for being with us. Ken Cooper, good to see you. It's been, what, 35 or 40 years since we last got together. And Bing Dempy will thank you for this discussion on sexual harassment in the workplace. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.